Good morning, church. How you doing? Yeah, everybody feeling good? All fired up. You know, I just want to say hey to everybody. So good to see you. You guys look awesome. If you're new, you're hanging out for the first time at City Line Church. I want to say hello. My name is Jack, and I get to be one of the pastors here. We're thrilled to have you with us this weekend. I uh, we just want you to relax, kick back, have a good time. I want to say hello to those tuning in online, wherever you are, Facebook Live or on our live feed. Uh, so glad you're joining us, and we can't wait to see you here again really soon. And also, I want to take a quick second to say, hey, what's up to all the moms and dads hanging out in the family room and those children? in the nursery. You know what I'm saying? We got babies going on all over the place here at City Line, and it's awesome. And so we got parents spread out everywhere, you know what I mean, watching kids and enjoying the service and being a part and staying connected. And so we want to say hi to you as well. And, uh, you know, if you don't know anything about our church, but a friend of yours just kind of said, you know what, you really got to show up today. You just got to come with me because you're going to love it. You know, you're going to have a good time. Uh, we, we think they're right. <laughs> you know, we think there's no better way to begin your Sunday than right here with us. And, and it's just because, you know, we get it. Uh, there's none of us that are perfect. We don't get it right. We don't know everything, but we're adamant about pursuing a better understanding of Jesus. And we know that he is the one who changes our life. And so we like to think of it as a, hey, this is the perfect place for imperfect people. And so if you're new to faith or you've been away from faith or you don't know what you think about Jesus or any of this, you just need to know we think you belong here. And we love it that you're with us and we're going to have a lot of fun talking today. Uh, today we're going to jump into part three of a series that we began a couple weeks ago. It's a series of discussions that's centered all around worship. Uh, this is a big deal for us, this, this series. We heard incredible feedback of what God is doing in the lives of people and their hearts as they kind of unpack this idea of worship. And so I'm super thankful about that. And, and I want to encourage you to continue to lean in to that today. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you up front. Uh, if you've never met me before, uh, I might get a little fired up when I preach today. Okay. Some of you are like, what's new? You know what I mean? Others of you are like, oh, that scares me. Don't be scared. Just join me. You know what I'm saying? Like just uh, let, let's do this together. Uh, because I think what we're going to talk about today is significant, and I want to be honest with you. I've been praying for you this week. I've been praying that today would be a day of freedom for you. I've been praying that today would be a day of breakthrough for you. I've been praying that something about this weekend as we engage with God's word and what God wants to do in our heart would be life-changing for you, be transformative in your approach to not only God, but the way that you worship God. We said that Jesus has a lot to say about this idea of worship. We know that worship is that, that giving affection to that very thing that, that we value most in our life. It's where we put our most time, our attention, all of our money and our resources go to those things that we value most. And Jesus, we understand that he should be number one in our life, that God should be first in our life. In fact, Jesus talks about worship and helps us to understand something clear that whether you follow him or not, we all worship something. Jesus understands how we've been created. He knows that you and I hardwired in our DNA. We're worshipers by nature. We can't help it. We, we're just designed that way. And we all worship something, whether you consider yourself a Jesus follower or not, we're wrestling with what does that look like and what exactly is that thing in our life. We said if that's God, then we understand that true worship to God comes from the overflow of a relationship with God. That's the importance of this kind of relationship. That's the kind of worship that Jesus is actually seeking. It's found in John chapter 4, starting in verse 23. It says, but the time is coming, and indeed is here now, when true worshipers, not False worshipers, but true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in this way. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We're unpacking what does that look like to be true worshipers? What does that mean in our life? What, what, what significance does that have in our life to actually be true worshipers? We said last week, if you were with us, that, that, that worship begins, though, in our hearts, not on our lips. It's not about just saying the right things. It's not about just knowing the right things. It's not just about being able to quote some scriptures, sing a few songs when you come in, check mark that box on your, your to-do list on Sunday. That's not what it's about. This is a heart thing. Because we understand that when God captivates your heart, it changes your posture towards God. You begin to lift your hands. You begin to bow down. You begin to shout out. You begin to proclaim his goodness in your life because you go from being a consumer of God's goods and a consumer of church and a consumer of, of, of the things that you think God provides for you to being fully consumed by the power of God in your life. It changes your outlook. It changes your posture, and you begin to worship God as a lifestyle. Today, I want to kind of unpack a few things. I want to teach us some stuff 
that I think is really important. And then I just want to leave a few moments at the end for us to participate together. I'm going to ask you to participate today, so I want you to think about it. If you didn't get notes on your way in, you're going to need those. There's a special piece of paper in there. It's not just for extra notes. You're thinking, man, Jack's going to talk really long today. You know, like, no, this, this piece of paper is something that you're going to need because that's how we're going to participate towards the end. People who have already come to church this weekend already, they're already participating, and it's been life-changing for them. That's my heart and desire is that it's life-changing for you as well. Here's a question I want us to start with up front. It's simply this. When you look at your life, what weapon do you use to attack your problems? What weapon do you use in your life to attack your problems? This is big. You got to think about this for a second. I really want you to think about your reactions. I want you to think about your responses. I want I want you to think about your go-tos. What weapon do you use to actually attack your problems? Anybody have any problems? Anybody? Anybody got any issues? <laughs> it's just me. Uh, problems. We all know what that's like. We got, we've got issues. We've got, got problems. There, there's situations. For some of us, we know exactly what they are. For some of us, it's battling with addiction or it's relational issues or the custody battle is out of control. The financial dilemma is way too big. Whatever that thing is, whatever problems you have in your life, what weapon are you using to attack those problems? When you're feeling attacked, when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling stressed out, what does that look like? When the problem arises in your life, sometimes I I would think that the natural tendency for you and I is to shut down or the natural tendency is to worry or a lot of times the natural tendency is to become anxious or depressed or discouraged or to turn to certain vices that we know soothe us for a certain time. If we could just have a little bit of, if we could just have some of, if we could just drink a bottle of, if we could just have our favorite comfort foods, Whatever those things are, they're vices that, that kind of soothe us for the moment, but they, but they never actually last when the tough stuff comes. Here's what we're wrestling with today is how do you respond when faced with adversity? How do you respond when you're feeling attacked? What do other people see as your response in your life when you're going through a difficult time? Now think about this for a second. If you need help, I brought some ideas of how you might respond normally. Some of you, you're kind of like the lightsaber person. Right? What happens is, is when the enemy attacks your life, when the attack comes, you know what you do? You try to bold up, right? Like you try to, you try to attack with your words. You will slay anybody with your words. You will cut people down with your attitude. Right? You're not going to let anybody do anything to you. You're not going to let anybody talk about But what you're going to do is you're going to, mm, I'm coming at them, right? Like I, I'm, I'm going in, I'm going to try to attack in and of myself. Some of you are like, well, no, my mouth is not my problem. Words aren't my problem. Okay, maybe you then are the deflector, right? You're the deflector. Every problem, every issue, everything that comes to you, what, you know, you're just like, you know, I'm rubber, you're glue. Everything bounces off me and it sticks onto you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you're just deflecting it. And when you deflect it, you never own any of it. Why? Because it's easier to blame somebody else. It's somebody else's fault right? It's not your fault. You didn't do it. I'm going to just deflect it. That way I don't have to deal with it. Hmm. Okay. Well, if that's not you, okay, then maybe I, this has got to be somebody in here. When the attack comes, the weapon of choice for you is, yeah, I got a problem. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to rise up and here's what I'll do. I'll let my anger take over. I'll let my anger take over to the point where I'll even do things that go against my normal character. People are actually shocked that I act that way. People are actually shocked that I responded that way. People can't believe the way that I did that. It's because we let our anger take us over and we think that this is the way that we can attack our problem only to know that we live in more regret after the fact than if we would have responded differently before the fact. Maybe some of you are like, well, it's not really anger. That's, you know, it's not not anger. Okay, well, then if it's not anger, it's not the deflector, it's not the slasher, then maybe it's just the mask wearer. You just like to cover everything up. You got issues. You know the issues are there. You got problems. You know the problems are there. But instead of addressing them, instead of attacking them, here's what you do. You just put the mask on and pretend like everything's cool. You pretend like everything is fine. You don't want anybody to know. In fact, you are so concerned about other people's perception of you and the way way people think of you and what they're going to think if they knew that you were dealing with some really serious stuff that you just say, I'm just content with wearing the mask because I never want to let anybody know. 
It's a serious question that I think you and I have to, listen to me, have to wrestle with this morning if we're going to gain any traction in our relationship with God is what weapon do you use to attack your problems? I think there's a bigger battle going on than what you and I recognize sometimes. It's not just your issue. It's not just your problem. It's not just your circumstance. It's not just the situation. I think it's deeper than that. I think it's not just a situational battle. I think it's a spiritual battle. Paul talks about it in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He says, our struggle, our problem, our issue, all the junk, the drama, whatever you want to call it in your life, is not against flesh and blood. Think about this. Husbands and wife in the room today, your problem is not your spouse. I know you might think it is. Who gets quiet in church when I talk about that? I'm going to speak into some marriages today. I'm telling you right now. I'm going to speak into some relationships. I'm going to speak into some lives today with the help of Jesus. So I need you to be open to it. The reality is the problem is not with your spouse. You might think it is, but there's something else going on. Did you know that you and your spouse, you made a covenant before God and family of love and of loyalty, and God said that that was a good thing? And did you know that there's an enemy that wants to attack that, that wants to take everything that God created as good and twist it to something that it was never meant to be? And so he'll pit you against each other, thinking that the problem is each other. Now, I'm preaching today. I'll tell you right now. I'm preaching. I'm just going to let that hang out for a second, let you wrestle with that. It's not against flesh and blood. It's not against your boss. Your boss isn't the issue. Neither is your bank. Yep, not in those notes, not in the notes at all. Like, it's not there. We're just going to roll with it, though. It's good. Flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of what? This dark world, this fallen world, this mess of a world that you and I live in, that's what's going on. And it's against, get this, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, I want to make note. I'm not trying to over-spiritualize everything because sometimes that's what we do. Oh, it's just the devil just attacking me. Oh, it's just the enemy just attacking me. No, let's be real. You made a bad choice. You made a dumb decision. That was not smart. God's given you smarts. He's given you wisdom. He's given you access to even more wisdom. The reality is that sometimes we just make a bad choice. We just make a bad decision. It's not the enemy's fault. That's on us. We got to own that. But there are times and there are circumstances that are bigger than us, that are going on around us, that we never thought that we would be in, that is an outright attack of the enemy because the enemy wants to utilize your problems and your issues to separate you from God and his goodness and the things that he wants for your life. The good things that God created, the enemy wants to separate you from that, and he'll do it by any means necessary. So I'm going to be careful not to over-spiritualize it, but at the same time, I think you need to recognize that there is sometimes an invisible battle, a spiritual battle that is going on that just because you can't see it does not mean that you should not be aware of it. Awareness is key. But you know exactly what's going on. Another way I want to say that is how you respond to the drama in your life says a lot about the role that God plays in your life. How you respond to the drama in your life says a lot about the role that God plays in your life. Here's what I want to suggest to you up front. As Christ followers, those of us that are following Jesus, learning to follow Jesus, I need you to recognize that worship is our main weapon of attack against life's problems. Worship is our main weapon against life's problems because worship, worship proclaims God's power. It speaks of God's authority. It proclaims about God's faithfulness. It centers us in the presence of God even when everything around us feels crazy. Even when we're unsure, even when everything is shaky, our worship centers us into the presence of God, and we know there is safety. We know in there there is protection. We know there there is provision. We know there that God has got it. But there's a key piece. How are we responding to these things that are going on in our life? I didn't put this in your notes because I, I want to encourage you to write this down. I would suggest that the first step to breakthrough in your life with worship is that you begin to focus on the difference between truth and information. Okay? Truth and information. I want to explain it like this. The weapons that God has given us, this is 2 Corinthians Okay, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, the weapons that God has given us that we fight with are not the weapons of this world. The weapons that you and I have been given are not the weapons of this world. Now think about this for a second. Again, spouses in the room, think about how you fight with each other. 
Think about who throws the cold shoulder first. Think about who's the first to talk about sleeping on the couch. Think about who the one that gets loud first, that gets crazy. Who's the one that, that, you know, whatever, hits things and throws things. Oh, well, we don't do that at home? The reality is that sometimes what we've done is we begin to, to try to fight the battle with the weapons that the world tells us we should fight with. Here's another weapon. Sometimes our world will tell us in your relationships and that covenant that you made, you know, whatever it is on that job where you're supposed to honor God on your job, not just work for your boss. The reality is if you're not careful, here's the way the world handles it. If you don't like it, guess what? You can quit. You can walk out. You know what? The marriage is on the rocks and you're frustrated and you think your spouse is the problem. Guess what? Then you can just divorce. You can just throw in the towel. You can just quit. That's the easy way. That's what the world might tell us. That's how the world tries to fix the problems. But the weapons that God has given us are much different. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. No, 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 no. He says, on the contrary, in contrast to that, he says, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Is anybody learning today? Because this is some good stuff. I'm telling you, my, my goal is freedom for your life. Understand this. The weapons that God has given you, the, the weapons that God has said, here, you have access to this. Your worship is a weapon that you have access to to proclaim the word of God over your life. And that weapon alone, it has divine power to demolish the strongholds in your life. What are the strongholds? The battle, the attack of the enemy in your life. Goes on. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What are we fighting against? Everything that tries to tell you, you don't need God. Do it your way. God's taking too long. God's kind of slow. His timing's all jacked up. You know what I'm saying? Like, you were praying for this weeks ago, and he still hasn't showed up yet. Whatever those things are that are drawing your mind and attention away from God's best for your life, he says we demolish those arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? The things that we know to be true of God. It's God's truth. It's his word. It's God's character. Everything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, here's what we do. We take captive every thought, and instead of going the world's way, we take captive of those thoughts, and we become obedient to God's way. We become obedient to Christ. In the moment, in the circumstance, in the situation that you and I are dealing with. The first step, the first step to overcoming the drama in our life is truth versus information. That we get a hold of God's truth over just the information. How many of you know there's a difference between truth and information? <laughs> there's a huge difference between truth and information. Information makes noise. It causes stress. It wants to play on our emotions. But truth, truth sets you free. Truth liberates you. Truth demolishes strongholds. Information says no one's going to love you. No one cares for you. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You don't have what it takes. But truth says, no, no, no. I'm loved. I have a heavenly father who cares. I am gifted. I am beautiful just as I am. I have wisdom. I I'm a work in progress, and God is not done with me yet. Amen. Think about the truth versus just simple information. When you get a hold of the truth, something should happen in your life. I would suggest that the truth in your head should awaken a passion in your heart. I'm tell you, I'm going to preach to somebody today. You can, you, can, you can choose to jump in now. We only got a few minutes left, or, 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 or you know, you can catch up online, right? But here's the reality. The truth in your head should awaken a passion in your heart. The idea that God's truth is the truth that we stand on. What God says about us, who God says we are, becomes the clear thing in our life that we hold to. It's the foundation of everything we are and everything we do. I got a lot to talk about today, so I'm going to encourage you to go to Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, it's right there in your notes. You can follow along on the screens. Luke wrote the book of Acts. He also wrote the book of Luke, right? He documents the life of this early church, the, the early first century followers of Jesus. Here we're going to pick up on a story of two guys named Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas have been preaching about Jesus. This weird situation happens where there's this girl who has an unclean spirit, and Paul speaks the word of God over her life. The unclean spirit leaves, and now her handlers or her keepers or those that owned this girl can't make money off her anymore. She can't tell fortunes anymore. She can't do it. And so now 
now the whole community is all enraged and freaked out about Paul and Silas and them sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. So much so, they decide they're going to put Paul and Silas in jail. Now, when I read this story, here's what I'm asking you to do. Can you put yourself in the situation? Can you look at your life right now and ask yourself, where are you being attacked? What does the attack look like in your life right now? What, are the, what is the battle that is raging in your life right now? And how are you actually attacking the problem? Do you have emotional issues? Is it, do you feel like it's, it's mental? Do you feel like it's, it's your sickness? It's your unemployment? It's, a, it's the breakup? It's the kids? Whatever it is, put yourself in this situation right here, right now. Acts 16, verse 22. The crowd joined the what? The attack. Paul and Silas are under attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them, listen what happened to them, to be stripped and beaten with rods. They were stripped and beaten with rods. Story goes on. After they had been severely flogged or severely beaten, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. You got to watch out for these crazy guys. They're out here talking about Jesus. They're out here setting people free. (laughs) They're out here breaking chains with the word of God, not in their own power, but by the power of God at work in them. Watch out for those guys. How many of you know that when you're following Jesus, sometimes the world around you, they just don't get it. They don't understand. It's It's not clear yet, but yet you are there to bring light into the dark place. Follow the story along. Story continues. Verse 24. When the warden had received these orders, he put them in the inner cell. And get this. He fastened their feet in stocks. Again, where do you find yourself in the story? When you look at your life, what kinds of things are trying to hold you back? What kinds of things have you locked down? What kinds of things just leave you feeling overwhelmed and stressed about your next step, about tomorrow, about what you're supposed to do next? What are the things that are affecting your life in this moment? Here's why I keep asking. You have to identify it. You cannot pretend like it's not there. You cannot act like it's psh, no big deal, I'll just get over it. I just need a little bit more sleep. I just need a little bit more of this. No, no, no. Identify what's going on, and then today I'm going to challenge you. you got to do something with it. You can't just identify it. you got to do something with it. Just like Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas saw that I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm being beaten. I'm being flogged. I'm being put in prison. I'm being chained up. I'm being locked in stocks. I, what am I to do next? How many of you know that when you're going through an attack and when you're having a problem or you're staring down an issue, how many of you know there's a decision that must be made? You got to make a decision, okay? That's my next step. Not only just identifying truth from information, right, because information is just information. But if we stand on truth, we respond differently. We also have to make a decision based on truth, not information. A decision. How many of you know that life has this weird way of bringing you to moments of major decision? to to bringing you to to a point of a defining moment in your life. Here's what I want to say about defining moments in your life. Your decision determines your breakthrough. Your decision in those defining moments will ultimately determine your breakthrough. You have to understand that. You have to own that. You have to accept that. The decisions and choices you make determines your breakthrough in those moments. I love that we have the example of Jesus. How many of you know that when Jesus walked this earth, he had a lot of decisions to make? (laughs) He had so many decisions to make. Think about this. For 40 days and 40 nights, he's out in the wilderness fasting, right? And the enemy shows up to tempt him, and Jesus had a decision to make. Do I just flex my power? (laughs) Do I just squash this dude? You know what I mean? Or or, or how do I respond? And I love what Jesus does. Jesus chooses to respond differently. Jesus is agonizing in the garden. He knows that the cross is imminent. Understand this. He knows that he is going to to be sent to a cross, to be killed upon a cross, to die on the cross. But Jesus was willing to die on the cross for you and I, willing to die for our sins because of the decision that he made. His decision brought forth your breakthrough. His decision brought forth your and my breakthrough. But understand this. His victory didn't begin on the cross. His victory began in the garden. (laughs) His victory began in the garden. It wasn't the cross. It was the decision that he made when he knelt down before his father and began to worship him and said, not my will, but your will be done. In other words, in my difficult moments, in my darkest circumstance, in my darkest hour, here's what I'm choosing to do. I'm choosing to trust you that you know exactly what you're doing, that I can place my faith in you, and I'm going all into this and saying yes to you. Talk about a moment of worship. 
Talk about an obedience that takes place before God. Scriptures say that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the Father. (laughs) Meaning, in victory, he gives us victory in our life. Because of his victory, because of his decision. Your decision determines your breakthrough. We, We worship God based on the truth of who God is. And the truth about God exposes the lies of the enemy. Paul and Silas are in jail. They're holding on to God and who he is. And then suddenly something happens. I love this part of the story. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. What? They got beat. They got stripped. They're chained up, right? Like They can't move. What else would you do? I'd be like, oh, this hurts so bad. How did we get here? You know, like, I mean, but instead, instead of letting their situation define who they were, they began to think about the goodness and the faithfulness of God, and they began to sing, and they began to praise, and the story goes on and says, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. I'm going to get fired up in a minute, but you got to think about this. I want to unpack this because this is a huge part of the story. At midnight, they were singing and praising and glorifying God. They were worshiping God in spite. They were using worship as a weapon. And as they begin to use worship as a weapon, things begin to change because worship has the power to break chains. Worship tears down walls. Worship, your decision to worship, it always precedes your victory. Understand that. Story goes on, verse 27, the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. If the, ch- if the chains came off and the doors opened up, you would think that they would be out of prison. But don't miss something huge here. Just because you're worshiping God in your moment, just because you begin to praise God, it doesn't mean that God is going to immediately change your circumstance. It means that the walls will start to fall and the chains will begin to break and the doors will come open. But in God's time, he will begin to lead you out of that situation. But at the very least, your praise begins to shake the very foundations of the craziness that's going on in your life. Come on, somebody. I know you're with me. I know you're soaking all this in right now. You know, it's good stuff, right? So Paul, they're there. They're, 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 they're hanging out in jail. The jailer, the jailer called for the lights, rushed and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, sirs, what do I have to do to be saved? How many of you know that your biggest problem, that biggest thing that's facing you is nothing compared to God? That as you begin to worship and praise God, that thing falls before you and trembles at the name of Jesus Christ. What do I got to do? It suddenly recognizes that you're not the problem. There's something wrong about that situation, right? Because the power of God begins to turn that thing around. And when God begins to turn that thing around, everything changes. They reply to the jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus, and guess what's going to happen? You're going to be saved. You believe in the Lord Jesus, and guess what? You too can receive life. You believe in the Lord Jesus, and you too can receive your deliverance, your freedom, your breakthrough by the power of Jesus Christ in your life. If you will believe by faith in Jesus Christ. Talk about the power of God. They're speaking the good news. They're speaking the word of God into their situation. That's going to be so important, so important. But here's what I want to unpack. We only have a few minutes left together because, like I said, I want to spend some time with some participation in just a few moments. But let's just, let's just kind of process what we just heard a little bit as it might relate to our life. What would it look like for us in our life to use worship as a weapon? For us to truly see worship as a weapon, to utilize it as a weapon in our life. Here, here's the first thing, if you're taking your notes, to use worship as a weapon makes God bigger than your battle. For you to choose worship as your weapon says, first of all, I'm going to make God number one in my life. When we begin to lift the name of Jesus on high, when we begin to proclaim the name of God over our situation, it keeps God on the throne of our life. It keeps God first place in our life. And when God is first place in our life, it says, God, this situation, this battle, this issue, this drama, it's way bigger than me, but I'm so thankful that it's not bigger than you, that God, there is nothing bigger than you, so I'm going to continue to praise you even in the middle of what's going on. I'm going to praise you regardless of what's happening in my life. Why? Because I know that you are bigger than my situation. 
King Jehoshaphat. How you like that for a name? Jehoshaphat, right? What if that was your name? If your, if your name's Jehoshaphat, what's up? You know what I'm saying? Like, King Jehoshaphat, right? He was facing a battle. He was facing a battle. He was leading God's people. As he was leading God's people, vast armies, Scripture says, this is the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 20, vast armies came to approach God's people. Jehoshaphat got word that all these armies were after him. He did not know what to do. So he kneels down before God, and he begins to cry out to God. He begins to praise God. He begins to lift God on high. And as he begins to lift God on high in the moment, how many of you know that God began to work and God began to move? It says that the word of the Lord came to Jehoshaphat. There were some people there. They heard the praising and the worship that's going on. And a guy shows up to Jehoshaphat, and he says something that I think you need to hear today. He says, hey, listen, King Jehoshaphat. Hey, listen, City Line Church. He says, and all who live in Judea and Jerusalem and Lakewood and Bellflower and Artesia and Cerritos and Long Beach and Wilmington and Southgate. Oh, I can go on. Anaheim and Buena Park and La Palma and Cyprus and Los Alamitos and San Pedro. How about Norwalk? How about Paramount? All y'all, right? Like, wherever you're from, right? Like, represent, okay? All who live in Judea and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. He says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Don't be afraid because of the drama and the issues that's facing your life right now. Instead, you need to understand something. For the battle is not yours, it's God's. The battle is not yours, it's God's. You might be right in the middle of it. You might be suffering the repercussions of it, the circumstances of it. But make no mistake about it. The battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. It is God's. He is fighting the battle. And here's some good news for somebody today. He's already won. The victory has already been given to you. You got to respond, though. You got to choose to respond to exactly who God is. Well, I praise God in advance because I know my victory is on the way. I know that the battle is not mine. It's his, so I will trust in him. We don't live under our problems. We don't live under our problems. We live under the mighty power of God himself. Second thing is this. Worship as a weapon refocuses us on the hope that we have in Jesus. It refocuses us on the hope that we have in Jesus. Jesus, let me ask you, where's your focus today? Has your focus been on the truth or has your focus been all, all the lies, on all the information? Oh, did you go to the doctor and you didn't hear what you wanted to hear? Did you go to your job and you didn't hear what you wanted to hear? What about all the drama that's broken out in your extended family and, and it's not good and it's not what you want to hear? There's all this stuff that's going on in our lives and we can focus on the information or we can focus on the hope that we have in Jesus. Worship reminds our hearts where our hope lies, that our foundation is in Christ, that he has never left us. He will never forsake us. He is always right there. Worship is a weapon because it's the only tool that most effectively shifts our skewed thinking and restores our minds to an eternal perspective. It gets our mind off the focus of everything around us, and it places it on Christ. And here's some good news when we do that. Psalms 34, 19. The righteous person may have many troubles. You're like, well, that stinks. I mean, we're going to have trouble. Yeah, Jesus said that himself. He warned you in advance, but he also said, but take heart. I've already overcome all that stuff for you. Take heart. I've already been there, done that. Take heart because I did that. You can you can with me, not by yourself, not in and of yourself, but with me. He says the righteous person may have many troubles, but guess what? The Lord, he delivers them from them all. The Lord delivers them from them all. Not some, not only the little ones, but the Lord, you know who he is in his very nature, his very character? He is a deliverer. He is a restorer. He's a renewer. He, he changes everything and he makes all things new. Regardless of your decision, regardless of your circumstance, regardless of what's going on in your life, there's deliverance that awaits you through the power of God in your life. Worship as a weapon also does this. I love this. Keeps the enemy in check. You better back up, boy. Right? Like, keeps the enemy in check, right? Like, you know who you're messing with, right? You know you're messing with the child of God, right? You, you know you're not just messing with me, but you're messing with God and all the angel armies, right? <laughs> Like, like you, you know if you're going to mess with me, you know, who's, you know who's got my back, right? 
right? As a matter of fact, you know who's got my front, who's got my sides, who's got my top and my bottom, right? His name is Jesus. You better back up. You better step, right? It keeps the enemy, it keeps the enemy in check. When we worship, all our problems don't just suddenly go away, though, but our worship puts the enemy in check. Your problems may not immediately go away, but it changes your perspective. When you begin to worship and praise God, man, something happens and the enemy gets checked. You know how we know? Jesus, again, Matthew 4, he was in the desert 40 days, 40 nights, fasting. And I love what happens in this situation. The enemy shows up to tempt Jesus and says, I know you're hungry, bro. I know you're hungry. So you know what? In all your power, you're so powerful, you can take those stones and you can turn them to bread. Yeah, just take the stones and turn them to bread. And Jesus, in his power, he could have done exactly that. He could have turned the stones into bread, but Jesus chose not to, cho- to turn the stones into bread. Instead, he said, man does not live by bread and by bread alone, but by every, get this, every word that comes from the mouth of God, every, from the word of God, from the truth of God, from what we know about God, that's what we live off of. Why would Jesus do something like that? Why didn't Jesus just like flick, you know, and the devil just goes flying, you know what I mean? Like, why did he just like, you know what I mean? Like, Boom, bread for everybody. You know what I mean? Like, like, why didn't he do that? Here's why I think he didn't do that. It's because Jesus chose to think of us in that moment. What? Yeah, Jesus knows that you and I, in and of ourselves, in our own power, we cannot defeat the enemy on our own. We are incapable of defeating the enemy on on our own. But with Jesus and his power in our life, we do have the victory. So what did Jesus give us to ensure our victory? Instead of just flexing some power, you know what he says? I'll give you something that has been given to you that everybody has. It is the word of God that you open up your mouth and you begin to speak truth into your situation. You begin to speak the word of God into your marriage. You begin to speak the word of God over your children. You begin to speak the word of God over your job situation, over your financial situation, over your health situation, and the word of God changes things. The word of God does something. It keeps the enemy in check. I love it. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I love that one one author says it this way, that, that, that worship, worship is a declaration of war against everything that says God can't. It's a declaration of war against everything that God, that, that says God can't. I don't know what the enemy's trying to whisper in your mind today that God can't, that God can't. But you need to know, oh, yes, he can. Yes, he can. When I use my worship as a weapon, here's what it helps me do. It chooses to praise my way to breakthrough. I choose to praise my way to breakthrough. God, I don't know how you're going to do it. God, this seems so hard. God, this is so difficult. But yet, instead, I'm going to Praise my way to breakthrough. Listen to this. About midnight, Paul and Silas, they were praying and they were singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. People were watching. These guys are crazy. I don't understand what's going on in their life, but all of a sudden, in that atmosphere, something began to shift. Instead of the atmosphere of prison invading their life, they decided to invade the atmosphere of that prison with the good news of Jesus and the presence of God through their worship, right? And as they begin to worship God, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I'm telling you, you have an opportunity to come loose today. Some of you, 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 you've had some doors that you've been trying to bust down and kick down yourself, and you need the power of God to do that. You need to begin to lift your hands and praise God. Use your worship as a weapon to push past those things that the enemy is trying to tell you that God can't. God can, and he will, if you're willing to surrender to him and say, God, you have all of me. Here I am. So I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to praise you in advance. I'm going to toda in advance, right? I'm going to declare your goodness. I'm going to give you thanks in advance of you working it out in my life. Here's what I want to ask you. What's your biggest problem in your life right now? What's the biggest problem that you have in your life right now? Matter of fact, take out that white piece of paper. Take out that white piece of paper. I ask these guys to come out because I want to worship with you right now. But here's the way I want to worship. It's a little different than what we're used to. Take out that white piece of paper. I want you to start writing down what are your problems. What is the biggest problem? Just be honest. Can, can, you, can we get honest in church for a second? What is your biggest problem? In other words, don't write down something that makes God look small. Don't be giving God just like the little stuff. 
I'm talking about dig down deep. What is the problem in your life? What is the battle in your life? Where are you being attacked in your life? Would you give it to God as a sign of God? It's hard for me, but I know it's not too hard for you. God, it's difficult for me, but I'm still going to trust you. What is that thing in your life that you need to hand over to God today? I want you to write it down. Is it your addictions? Is it your escapism? Is it that stuff that you've been caught up watching that you know is not good for you? Oh yeah, we're gonna get real in church today. That's, that's what church is for. We become real in, in front of a real God and he's the only one that has the power to actually change our real life. We're not living in a fantasy world here. This is real stuff. Write down your biggest problem to God. As you write down your biggest problem to God, here's what I'm encouraging you to do. I'm encouraging you to get up out of your seat and bring it up here to these steps. Just bring them to the steps and just leave it here as a sign of I'm surrendering this to you, God. Today I'm writing down my biggest problem. I'm acknowledging it. I'm giving it over to you and I'm surrendering it. Here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to walk up here and drop it and, and then walk back to our seats and I got problems. No, this is not write and drop and go. You know what this is today? This is I'm writing it out. I'm surrendering to you. And in advance, God, I'm going back to my seat and I'm going to worship. It's very important that we worship together before we leave today. So I know you might have somewhere to go. You might have something to do. I know you're concerned we might run into the next service. Whatever. I don't care at this point. What God wants to do in our life and what he wants to do in our heart is more important than our agenda. So I need you to press into this moment. Write down the things that are your problems. Bring them before God. And let's go back and let's begin to celebrate like we've already won the victory, knowing that God is already working it out. In Jesus' name. Come on, church. Let's celebrate today.